invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is a day that had long <clears throat> been awaited by the early church and uh, they were looking for the fulfillment of Scripture to be done on this day concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit to uh, you might say, energize the church, give the church the power to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It had already been commissioned to go into the world and preach the gospel, but the actual empowerment came on the day of, of Pentecost, and what a glorious day that was. And over 3,000 souls came to know Christ as their Savior that day and were added to the church. Let's begin our reading in verse 37. Now when they heard this, that is the word that Peter had preached, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now this <coughs> verse has created confusion in the minds and the Lord of course never intended for it to create confusion. It's just that people don't understand Elizabethan English when they read this. And uh, when you read the King James you're reading Elizabethan English and they didn't speak exactly the way we southerners do. And uh, so when he said <coughs> be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. That didn't mean that being baptized would take away their sin. It meant that because they had been saved that they would have followed Jesus in baptism. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. This morning I'd like for us to think about five things that the sinner must do to come to Christ. And I'm not trying to complicate salvation by any means. That all we have to do is believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us we shall be saved. Nothing more, nothing less. But then maybe to look at it from a uh, point of view of uh, someone who would be confused about how to come to Christ. First of all, there must be a realization that a person is a sinner. And the Bible teaches us that we're sinners and that in sin that our mothers conceived us. We're also taught that uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. And so since we're sinners, there needs to be some remedy for sin and that remedy is the Lord Jesus Christ. God is upon the throne in heaven Jesus, his son, is willing to seek and to save those who are lost. The Holy Spirit is available to bring conviction to the heart of the unbeliever. And so if you realize that you're a sinner, you've made a great step forward in coming to Christ. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, we're taught that all unrighteousness is sin. So it's not hard to come up with a clear definition of sin, is it, if we turn to the scripture. And sin is failing to do what is right. Sin is doing what is wrong. But inherited sin is that that we receive from Adam. And the only way that it can be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. In Romans 3.22, we read, or 3.23 rather, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, few people 
will even lay claim to perfection. I met very few people who claim to be perfect. And I, I know that you remember me sharing with you one time about I was preaching revival in the church one time. And uh, of course, I, I learned better after that to not ask people to raise their hands in the service. But I asked a man, or I asked that congregation that morning, it was in a morning service during the week, and I said, Is anyone here perfect? One man raised his hand. I said, sir, I'd like to speak to you after the service. So he came around, looked me up after the service. And he began to tell me how that he was perfect in Christ. That he'd not committed a sin since the day that he was saved. And he, of course, didn't understand what the Bible teaches about sin. And the Bible teaches us that the Lord's faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But just because we're saved doesn't mean that we live a life of sinless perfection. And so if you don't claim to be perfect today, then that's good. But if you're sitting there and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you're claiming to be perfect, I'm afraid that you're deluded. I'm afraid that you are deceived and I'm afraid that you're confused about what the Bible teaches concerning salvation. Now, not only do you need to understand that you're a sinner, you need to understand that you're a lost sinner. Many will admit that they're sinners, readily admit it. But then they will not so readily admit that they're a lost sinner. It's kind of like the story is told about uh, a man uh, knocking on another man's door and uh, asking for uh, directions. And uh, he said, uh, are you a Christian? And he said, no, sir, I'm a smith. He said, Mr. Christian lives in the second house down here on the left. And uh, so he, he misunderstood the term Christian. And just because a person would bear uh, the name Christian doesn't necessarily mean that they know the Lord. It's their relationship with the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And so, as I think about that, uh, th there are people who, who make this statement, you know, well, I'm doing the very best that I can do. But the problem is the very best that we can do will not please God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It, it pleased God that through the sharing of the word of God uh, that men uh, and women and boys and girls could hear uh, the gospel message uh, in whatever form that it comes by uh, through preaching from uh, the pulpit, uh, through Sunday school literature, through a tract, through personal witnessing, however it may uh, reach the individual, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It pleases God to save sinners through the gospel, believing the gospel. In Luke 18, there's a primary example of this. Two men went to the temple one day to pray. One was a publican, and the other was a Pharisee. The Pharisee was a self-righteous individual. Apparently, a man filled with pride. And, of course, that uh, as, as he went in there and uh, he saw who was already in the house, he saw that this publican was in there. And of course, publicans were tax collectors. And he looked over there at uh, th this tax collector and he probably went, And he began to tell God how good he was. Have you ever tried to tell God how good you are? And he began to thank God that he was not as this publican man. Well, though publican, he felt bad enough as it was, and he just bowed his head and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible said he left there justified, justified in the eyes of God. The Pharisee left unjustified because of his 
pride and his inability to recognize that he needed to humble himself in the sight of God and receive Jesus as his Savior. And so when we try to tell God how good we are, God doesn't want to hear that. What is God looking for? He's looking for the blood, just as he was that night in Egypt uh, thousands of years ago uh, when the Passover was instituted and uh, God passed over the land and uh, that only those that had applied the blood uh, were spared in that household. Those who failed to apply the blood in that household, the firstborn of that family was taken in, in every household. And there was much wailing and uh, much wailing and weeping the next morning when the Egyptians arose for the day, because probably in every Egyptian household someone had died. They had failed to apply the blood. You're talking about a mass funeral. Probably untold thousands had to be buried that day because the blood had not been applied. Some of the same people who feel that they're doing the best they can kind of have the idea that good works are sufficient for salvation. If that had been the case, then all of those from Adam's day up until the time that Jesus came who would have performed good works would not have needed the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said on one occasion, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter in to the kingdom of God. That is that uh, it must be far above the righteousness of others if you expect to enter into the kingdom of God. And the only way we can attain unto that righteousness is to look up. Look up to the Lord because Jesus will impute his righteousness unto us and then because of his righteousness that God will look upon us and have mercy upon us and we'll be a part of the kingdom of God. There just simply cannot be any salvation until there's a recognition on the part of the sinner of their need of Christ. And the Holy Spirit reveals that need. I've had people come, come to me and say, you know, why is it that, and they give maybe a, a period of time, a recent period of time that I, I've come to church and, and every time I come to church, I just feel miserable when I leave. And I said, it could be God's dealing with you. Could be the Holy Spirit is inviting you to trust Christ as your Savior. I said, if you'll get your business straight with God, you won't be miserable when you come to the house of the Lord. You can rejoice in the goodness of God. You can rejoice in the Lord's salvation. So the sinner must recognize not only is he a sinner, he's a lost sinner. Sinner, you must recognize that only God can help you. Only God. Now, if you came down with some malady, some physical malady, And you decided that, uh, well, I probably need to make an appointment with a physician. Go get checked out and see what's going on. You went to the doctor's office and he or she did a thorough examination and asked you a bunch of questions about your illness. They'd sit down on that little swivel stool they look at you and they say, I don't know what's wrong with you. I really don't. But he said, we need to find out what's going on. 
And so we're going to do a battery of test. Beginning with x-rays. Then we're going to do scans. We're going to do blood work. We're going to try to find out what's going on. And then you go through all those tests and set an appointment to go back to get the results. And the doctor said, we don't know any more now than we did before we ran the test. But we know something is wrong. And that has happened. And you say, well, what in the world am I going to do? And the doctor said, well, I know a specialist that might could help you. We'll set you up an appointment with a specialist. And you go to the specialist and maybe that specialist can find out what's going on. You make the appointment with a specialist and you take copies of the records of the tests that you had. That doctor goes over them and examines you and says, well, I don't know what's going on either. I suggest that you go to Birmingham or New Orleans or Atlanta or whatever, Houston, get those doctors out there to check you. So you make an appointment at wherever, and you go and that doctor scratches his or her head and says, I don't know what's wrong with you. You just about want to throw up your hands in frustration, wouldn't you? You think, well, something's going on, and I know something's going on, and no one can find out what it is. But thank God it isn't that way with sin, that we know what's going on. And the great physician has already diagnosed our case. If we're lost, that we're lost, uh, and we're dead in trespasses and sin. And the only way that we can be quickened and made alive is through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the great physician. We don't have to throw up our hands in despair. The Lord's not going to say, I don't know what's wrong with you if we're lost. He knows exactly what's wrong. And if you'll admit it, sinner, you know what's wrong. You know you're a sinner and need the mercy and grace of God. So why don't you come to the great physician, the specialist in spiritual things? I had a young man one time. I pastored his family and we were eating uh, a meal with him on, on Sunday. I had a little boy, he's about 11 or 12 years old. Brilliant little boy. I mean, he, one of the smartest children in his school. And he was always asking questions, you know, I think about Jesus as he uh, asked questions and answered questions to, uh, to the lawyers and uh, the doctors and all uh, in his day when he was 12 years old. And I don't remember what the question was, but I was sitting there at the table and he came to me and he said, you're the expert. I said, I need to know this. And so he didn't know, but I wasn't the expert. Only the Lord's the expert. But he thought he knew where to go to get the answer that he needed. And he was on the right track. He went to the man of God. Sinner, you need to get on the right track and go to the Lord. If you expect to be saved. A lost sinner cannot please God. You say, how so? Well, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 40, or 64 rather, that all of our righteousnesses, plural, are as filthy rags. The best we can do is as filthy rags in the sight of God. A filthy rag is no good for anything except to be cast away. 
And isn't it wonderful that the Lord doesn't cast us away when he looks down upon our soul that's dead and trespasses in sin? How many times have you walked up to a lifeless body, say in a uh, funeral home or in a church, and you've looked over in that casket and you see the remains of the person that used to live in that body? I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard people t trying to talk to those people in the casket. Well, that's just the remains. That's just the tabernacle. That's just the house they lived in. And, and they, they can't hear you then. I saw a young man one time just, his dad had passed away and uh, he, he crawled up in the casket and was trying to pull his dad out. That wouldn't have done any good. So we're helpless to help ourselves. There's no way that we can get from where we are uh, to where God is on our own. We, we have to come by the way of the cross. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. No exceptions. No presidential pardons. The way of the cross leads home. We must be helped by God. But you know, God, sinner, has already helped you and you don't even know it. You don't even realize it. You say, well, how so? Christ has come and paid the sin debt for you. It's already been paid. But the problem is you haven't received it. God has already been satisfied. His requirement was that at the travail of the soul of Jesus Christ that he'd be satisfied. And that took place over 2,000 years ago. And that satisfied God's requirement. The job is finished. There's nothing more that needs to be done on God's behalf. He's already done it all through his son Jesus. And sinner, when you've done all that you can possibly do, and you fail, there's only one thing left to do. And that's fall in the loving arms of God. Ask him to have mercy on your soul. And save you for Jesus' sake. But you must be willing to receive his help. Stop depending on yourself. Many people will depend on themselves and they'll say that somehow, some way, I'm going to make it into heaven without trusting Jesus as my Savior. You know, people get across our southern border every day, some days by the thousands. The hands of the Border Patrol are tied by the current administration. And those who try to enter illegally are supposed to be detained and sent back. But there are always those who, in the darkness of night or something of that sort, will sneak through. But you can't sneak into heaven. You can't bargain with God. You can't come up with some device or some scheme to get around God's plan. You have to come his way. 
And again, stop depending on yourself what you can do and depend upon what the Lord has already done and accept it as a free gift of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, sinner, it's in your hands. The ball's in your part. And it's time for you to take action. It's time for you to call. The Lord's already called upon you. If you've ever been burdened about your relationship with the Lord, if you've ever been burdened of your sin, the Lord has already called upon you. So how are you going to respond? Are you going to say, yes, Lord, I'll trust Jesus. Are you going to say, no, Lord, I'll work it out for myself? Again, I can't overly emphasize the fact, and it is a fact, that you cannot do it on your own. We spoke about the publican and the Pharisee in the temple. How the Pharisee was a self-righteous man and thought he could do it himself. The Pharisee left unjustified. The publican cried out for the mercy of God. He was justified. Some people have the idea that they've not really done anything bad in this life. That they're a good person. That they came from a good family. A loving, kind, Christian family. And they've gone to church all the days of their lives. And because of these things that God will allow them into heaven. It doesn't make any difference if the Apostle Paul was your granddaddy. It, doesn't, it wouldn't make any difference if the Virgin Mary was your mother. You can't get into heaven without Jesus. Mary could not get into heaven without Jesus. She had to trust in him. The baby that she gave birth to, she had to trust in him as her savior. It's God's way or no way. And that's not because God is uncaring or that he's some kind of despot. It's that it's the only fair way. In order to be fair with others, that all must come the same way. Young, old, rich, poor, and all in between, all tribes, all nations, must come through Jesus. If God had done it any other way, it would not have been fair. Some would have had an unfair advantage over others. But God made it where everyone had to come the same way. I had to be saved the same way you did. In closing today, are you willing to allow God to do a work of grace in your heart? To call upon Him, put yourself behind Put him first. We ask for a verse of imitation him. The Lord's dealing with you today. Would you trust Christ as your Savior? There's one here. <clears throat> you're visiting and you feel led to unite with this church. If you have a prayer request, whatever your need would be, you come as we stand and sing.